So we just got an exclusive deal across my desk of a 100% vacant office building that was probably worth somewhere between 30 and $40 million for $7 million. Wow. It's 100% so, vacant. So, and it's not something I want to buy. So that's the interesting thing. So we're just now seeing the very, very beginning of obviously, you know, this, this vacant office building collapse. It's very interesting. Awesome. So you're not buying this no, building. No, no, I'll tell you why. We're going to do it like discount, yeah. right? Yeah, like it so this is exactly what I've been trying to tell everybody. Uh, it's basically worth the land plus demolition. So mm -hmm. it's it's listed at seven and a half million dollars. Now just to, just to give you a little perspective, it's a hundred and seventeen thousand square feet. So that's a pretty big office building. It's four stories. Mm -hmm. It's in great shape. And, you know, but it's 100% vacant. So so if, if you just take a look at the math, I figured it's probably, you know, two fifty, three hundred dollars $300 a foot roughly to replace it, not including the land. So, you know, it's somewhere in north of $30 million, we'll just say. That means there's a lender of $20 million, probably at least, and that also means that there was equity from somewhere, okay? Right. So those are the two things, and, and it's being sold for seven. And um, I don't know. I don't even think it, I, I'm not interested in it at seven. Right. Because it's like seven acres. So they're, they're basically asking a million bucks an acre, <laughs> not including the demo. So what's like a normal price per acre, would you say? Well... To, you, you know, traditionally, it depends on the height. Obviously, you can go four, four stories because the office building's there. Um, you, you know, you we would want to pay probably about $30,000 a unit, mm -hmm. twenty dollars to $40,000 a unit for dirt. Okay, so just to put things in perspective, obviously, um, you get about 17 to 20 units per acre. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's traditional. So we would want... Um, now this one you might be able to go a little higher. You probably you're probably looking at um, you know uh, some garage parking down below, perhaps. A lot of it's going to de depend on this what the city allows, which of course is also a huge thing. So when it's zoned office and it's zoned light industrial, I looked it up. It's it's called A1 zoning in Phoenix, city of Phoenix, and so you have to get that changed. Uh, you have to go to what's called high density residential. That would be another thing. So you know, you, you so density is how many units can you get on there? That would be one. So you have to change the zoning, but then you also have to bring the whole concept to the city. So you have to say you have to hire an architect. You have to get all that stuff, all the all this what we call the soft costs, right? You have to get all that stuff, the renderings, and all that stuff together, and be able to present something to the city. Right. So let's just move it back a little okay, bit. You're right, kind of right, jumping right. ahead well, of your bike. So basically what you just said is that if they could get 20 units on and you, they were paying 30000 a unit, then it would be 600000 So you think it's about half. Oh, it's less than math. half. Yeah, yeah it's it's less than half for sure. Mm -hmm. y you know, it's they're asking seven. Obviously, it's it's a land play at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. It's. It's too bad because it's a nice office building. Right. And like you said, you know, just a few years ago, it would have been worth a lot more if it was 100 percent occupied. Well, this I like to this is why I always tell people, you know, what what's a property worth? It's obviously worth a lot more if it's occupied. Well, but I do want to. So so I have to, you know, bring up what everyone's kind of talking about, yeah. which is why not just convert it to, to rentals, yes you know right. just, well, just make it multi-family like I there's know. all these empty office buildings you just got to make them all multi-family yeah, yeah you guys if you saw the building <laughs> you would not want to live there one of the one of the things is the location itself i wouldn't want to let's put it this way i wouldn't take you on a date there <laughs> let's put it that way i mean it's not a place that you'd really want to be maybe during the day but not during at night so um, it does have a couple really positive things. So let's talk about that first. It's located near a major freeway, okay, like a block off. It's in an opportunity zone, which is good. So if those of you don't know what opportunity zones are, uh, you should look them up. It's actually a heck of an opportunity to raise money into opportunity zones and redevelop areas. Typically, these opportunity zones are in areas that a lot of people don't want to be. 
but that's the whole point of them is to revitalize areas that uh, not a lot of money is flowing into. Um, and it does have the new light rail going near it. So it, I don't know if it has a stop near there, but having a light rail as transportation or access is good. Those are the positives. The negatives is there's a failed mall <laughs> across the freeway. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about malls. You know, malls are just going, just getting beat up, right? Because you guys, are, everyone on this <laughs> watching here, they want their stuff like today. Like, you know, they order a jacket, they order dog food, doesn't matter. They want it today. They're, you're not even leaving your houses anymore. Like their boxes are just showing up, as you guys know. Okay, so malls are dead now, but mostly they're incredible spots. Like these malls are like right in the middle of these incredible places, generally. So this mall across the freeway is being redeveloped. And one of the things that the mall developers tried to do, because they're also losing money across, like this is like within maybe less than a quarter mile, 2,500 more units. So, so the mall developers tried to get a, apartment people, apartment guys, developers, contr uh, construction across the freeway. And this particular office building is 100% vacant. It's also trying the same thing. So so one the land cost is too high two it's not entitled it's you know there's a lot of there's a lot of upfront work the city has to approve it and and then you have all that potential supply going up in the across the street and it's a redevelopment area which is um you know also uh, it's good and bad and, but the opportunity zone is probably what people are trying to hang their hat on so I want to uh, run this video that you did that kind of goes over some of this office to multifamily conversion, because I think that this is an important topic because a lot of people are talking about this right now. Yep. So Jerry, can you tee that up, please? So I just sold this building for over $9 million. We had a huge profit, but I'm going to show you today why you can't convert office buildings into residential. So we got to be careful because I don't own the building anymore. So come on with me. So here's the first reason. So you see these bathrooms? They have bathrooms like this on every floor. So this is three floors. They have first, second, and third floor. So if I'm going to convert this to residential, and let's say each floor plate is, let's say, 10,000 feet, I'm probably going to get maybe four or five units at the most out of each particular suite for residential. And so one of the biggest things is how do you figure out all the plumbing and the sewage, of course, the water heaters, the washers and dryers, all those things, and the kitchens for all of these individual suites. So just think about offices that you've been in or maybe you work in. So in most offices, like this building, you don't have bathrooms inside each individual suite. So this would require all the plumbing, all the sewage, all the stuff to be ripped up into the concrete and actually rerun for all of this particular building. So that's the first problem. And then in addition to that, not all offices, of course, especially even smaller ones, have kitchens. So you'd have all of that as well. Just that alone would be in the millions of dollars to be able to rip down into the concrete and then to plumb all the way up. Also, who wants to live in an environment like this where everything pours out into this little courtyard, which is, of course, an office building? So when people are coming and going, of course, for business, it's fine. But how about for residential? Like, where are people going to park? that I want to come visit. Where, what are you going to do if you have a pet? And most importantly, like when you move into a place, you want a fitness center, you want a pool, you want all those kinds of things. You want a lot of common area amenities like that. So you'd have to put all of that in. And if you put a fitness center into this building, of course, it would just take away from the property itself. So we're now in the elevator, of course, one of two that goes from the one to the third floor. And here's the thing. This building is already, let's say $9 million. So if I'm able to get four or five units per floor, which would be say 12 to 15 units, there's no way that I would pay four or five, six hundred thousand dollars for each unit. And that's before the renovations. There you go. <laughs> so I wanted to break that down uh, just because, um, you know, the first issue with a conversion and mind you they are marketing this as a possible conversion. Well, they are actually that's why it came yeah. to me because yeah. i'm the multi-family guy so i i got it in my inbox right so the first issue with that is it needs to be zoned correctly and you touched on this at the beginning but you didn't really dive into this so 
in order to be zoned correctly, you wouldn't be able to really know if it would be because they're in the process of getting it zoned correctly. But in order to get that approved, you need a plan. You need like an architectural right. plan drawn right. to present to the city. Yep. So so just I'll just walk you through that. So there's a reason why nobody can build, let's say, an industrial building next to your residential home. Or, you know, there's a reason why when you go to an industrial area, everything's industrial or, you know, everything's single family as an example or light industrial or, or whatever. There's, you know, specific areas around airports, specific areas around shopping centers and stuff like that where things are zoned. And this is zoned A1, in which in Phoenix is light industrial. So that's the zoning today. Now, can it be changed? Yes. Have we done that before? Yes. But there's a process and it's not easy. So you have to go to the city. You have to get them to change the zoning. And the way that they are going to do that is if you have to show them a better plan. And so there's a process and a cost and it takes time. So that's just step one. That's step one. So then once and if that gets approved, then you have the issue of how much it's going to cost to renovate the building. If you convert it, right? If I actually think it's it. like a full rip down personally right I, I probably wouldn't try right but if you're going to convert it because okay. that's what everyone's all right. talking all about. right so let's say it's 117,000 square feet we know this right? right and let's say that the average unit is a thousand feet that means you got 117 units that's it right at, at a thousand that's if everything the math works perfectly <laughs> Um, now, you might have two one bedrooms and studios and two bedrooms and three bedrooms and all that kind of stuff in there. But on the average, you know, you're, you, it's in the low 100. So just that alone, um, I can tell you from personal experience, we don't try to do anything under 200 units because it, it takes the same amount for me to run a 117 unit converted office building as it does a 200 unit office or a multifamily building. So the, the, the staff, the overhead, a lot of things are very similar. In other words, that extra 80, 90 units takes about the same amount of people. So, um, so your costs, operational costs are going to be significant. So, so about how much do you think it is a square foot to do renovations yeah, like this? Yeah, that, that I haven't figured out. Okay. But, I'd have to go physically into the building and take a look. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, but it would be significant, you know, because most of those office buildings are set up like all of them. Do you think it would be more expensive to renovate than to rip down? That's why just, I do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can buy the whole thing right now. It's listed at seven million. I can tell you, I think that that's probably about what it costs to renovate um, realistically. And then, you know, and then so that's why it's easier just to, negotiate it down to basically one or two million and then rip it down and then maybe maybe you've got a developable site you know think about what you want in this location is a high security type building because the location's not great now you guys don't have the benefit like i do to know the area i know the area it's not a spot that you're going to want to move you're going to want it gated fenced you're going to want the high walls. You're going to want in, ingress and egress. You're going to want a two-story parking garage probably at the bottom and then units over the top. You know, so the construction costs are going to more, be more. You're not going to want a surface parked, which means surf. So the way it's set up right now, it's all surface parked and the office building's in the middle. You guys have probably seen a thousand of these. You pull up, there's lots of parking, and, and you walk to the middle, which is the office building. You would have to do something from a security standpoint because it's a little dicey in that area at night, which is also why it's in an opportunity zone. Well, plus you wouldn't have, I mean, adding that many more tenants, I wouldn't think they would have enough parking because if That's you had a 117 yeah. tenants yeah. and there was two people That's to a, a unit. You know. There's a parking requirement. Every city is a little bit different, but generally it's one space per bedroom. Mm -hmm. So it's not exact, but let's say you need one space for one bedroom, two spaces for a two and three for a three. So, those are certainly things that and then you have to have ADA or American Disability Act you have to have handicapped there's a whole bunch of things plus you have all the fire 
um, ingress, egress, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot when you're doing development. When you're laying out something, there's a lot to consider. Um, now, this property probably already has done a lot of that, obviously. It probably already has ADA. It probably already has all those kinds of things. But if you're, um, if you're, if you're trying to convert it, it, you're probably fine. But the real issue is who wants to live in a converted office building you know, in a what I would call a, a C or a D location. Do, do you think that um, there is a world where y- it's almost dorm style, where you just make <laughs> units and they share the kitchens and they share the bathroom? Well, maybe not my world. But, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, gosh. I mean, affordable. How I, I mean, mean it would that's, be affordable. that's how I started when I was in college. I don't want to go back there. <laughs> well, but, but also with affordable housing, maybe. I mean, that would be more affordable. Well, by the time you convert it, it's not going to be an affordable to to do it. Right. So that's actually part Even of the problem. Even without the plumbing and all. That. Yeah, like. I get where you're heading and and it's something to it's something to to look at but at the end of the deal this this the equity's gone the lender's toast and um they're just trying to get a little bit for it my uh, I think it's not even worth you know it's worth maybe a million or two bucks cuz you're going to have to rip it down and then get something permitted you know right. And, and that's probably what will happen. It'll sell for one or two million bucks, maybe three at the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and then somebody might just take a flyer on it and rip it down. You know, to rip it down and de- demolish, it's several million dollars. You know, and that's going to be your basis for your land. And then you, of course, you know, have a ton of... Um, a, t- a ton of more expenses and you got to get all that approved from the city well and people really aren't doing a lot of construction right now because construction construction loans are what about well 10%? that's the other thing yeah. right yeah so yes yeah i mean you're looking at nor- north of 10 percent for uh renovation or construction debt it's all personal guarantee too by the way mm-hmm. which means that um you can't hide behind an llc with a personal guarantee they go after your assets so you know because they're at risk. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing a redevelopment, you have that. Now, the opportunity zone is enticing. A lot of people raised a lot of money during the opportunity zone uh, time frame. This was passed under Trump. Uh, there are actually still some good ones out there. Uh, we actually, Ross and I are doing one. And um, it's, it's a great way to divert capital gains into, um, into certain areas. Well, and Brenda said dorm living would be better than homeless. Uh, and Eli said, I've seen three units sharing a bathroom. And I, I have seen that in California where our different units share yeah. bathrooms. Um, but I think that in order to make these condo or these uh, apartment conversions worth it, the government's going to have to really step in, offer certain loans, offer certain financing, offer certain tax credits, and then maybe it'll start to make sense. Uh, yes, all that has to happen. I, I, this is the beginning of the office. Um, you know, we, we've talked about this. We were ahead of this, as you guys know, maybe six months, a year ago, I've been doing videos on this. This is just one. You, you know, in one year from now, these are going to be everywhere. And everybody's going to, you know, the brokers, <laughs> they don't know quite what to do with them. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you've got the same thing. You've got a, got a seller. Oh, this one in particular is filed for bankruptcy just to, you know, add a little bit. So, so you have that. Um, so you, know, you, you have the bankruptcy protection pr- of the partnership as well. Um, you know, it, this is, this is a mess. So you, you have to unwind that as well. Yeah, it's really, and I, I watched, uh, I was kind of looking on YouTube at some of this stuff and I don't know if you agree, but I saw a guy on there saying, you know, the ceiling height has to be a certain height too, because when you start putting all the plumbing and all the HVAC systems in every unit, you have to have room for that in the ceiling. So you yeah. don't want to drop it below like that an eight foot be. ceiling. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. So, so anything new, as you guys know, all, all our stuff that we're building, even custom homes, you're, you're, you're looking at nine foot ceilings, you know, so that's kind of the norm now. And um, they used to be eight way back. So depending on this property, you might have that issue as well. You, you, you know, you might have the low ceilings, which will help, will hurt, sorry, um, you know, on the, on the conversion. Might kill the conversion. Yeah, and there's a lot of people, you know, speaking to this that are trying to do office conversions and very few buildings, you know, it's like one in 10 or one in 15 are actually able to be converted due to... The ceiling heights, yeah. the locations, the age of the building, all of those yeah. kind of things. And I, the reason we brought this up today is one that just came across my desk. It's, um, it is exactly the model I've been talking about. Equity's gone. 
The lender's going to take it in the shorts. They're going to have to write down this loan. It's going to affect their, you know, the banks themselves. What that's going to do is going to make those banks pull back on the tightening, and um, they're going to lend less. And you know, the whole thing's a cycle. And this is the beginning. And you're going to start to see more and more and more of these. And the, you know, the the point of this video or the point of this uh, talk is not to bang on office building conversions. It's just to educate you on that. This is the beginning. You're going to start to see a lot of these and. Some of these are going to work. Yeah. Some of these deals are going to work. They're going to be in the right location. They're going to be um, the the right price, and um, you know perhaps it's going to work. But this is a big building. One hundred seventeen thousand square feet is not a small building. When I build something, Ross and I are building something. We we're, we have right now a three hundred thirty unit property under construction and we're actually finishing up and we're in the middle of a lease up you know everything we do is in over 200 so you, you know there's a there's a certain size that you want if you're going to build you might as well build as big as the city lets you mm -hmm. and that is kind of the point you want to you want to maximize your density on a piece of land because it maximizes the return and in this particular case you're stepping into a footprint of somebody else and you're restricted when you have the courtyards and stuff that's just a waste of space really. yeah in this particular case there's a lot of surface parking all the way around which you don't really even need now you there is a case for maybe you can build some garages maybe you can put some storage units maybe you can do some other things maybe you can build some other units again it's just cost but also you have to the city has to approve all this you know somebody sitting at the city is going to have to agree before this even works and then and only then you got to bring it to the money again, you know. Right? How do you, you raise money? For yeah, you have like a bankruptcy. That. You have a lender that's uh, obviously a seller that's already in default or a partnership. You have a lender that's that's losing it in the shorts, and now you're going to go with a new plan. So I'm not saying it can't happen, but uh, this this is going to be a very interesting time, you know. Becky said that you need to tell this to Congress. So she feels you need, I to, know. You need to present to Congress. So just add it I'll to just your show, calendar. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just show <laughs> give me give me a meeting. I'll just show these buildings are they're they're popping up. It's it's nuts. Like, by the way, this building you should see the pictures. They, these are some nice interiors, like marble, beautiful lobbies, and like these are this is not by any stretch of the mean a um uh, a, pr a property that you would ever even think you would rip down right yeah it's it's very interesting um so make sure i have a webinar coming out on wednesday it's free if you're sitting on your house and you're wondering whether to sell it or rent it out or what or stay in it this is the webinar for you um, go ahead and go to kenmacroy.com forward slash webinar steve will put it in the chat and join me 1 p.m. Pacific time. That'll be fun. So let's jump into our questions from Ken Pro. For those listening on YouTube, make sure you ask. I'll get to a couple of your questions. So our first question comes from Alex. They said, Ken, with the state of the economy and how volatile a yield savings account is still worth it, while interest rates are still high. How long do you think that'll last? And what are some similar investments? Yeah, it's a good a question. Questions. Yeah, that's actually a great one. Uh, it's funny. I was thinking about this. You know, so let's talk about what a high yield savings account is. Uh, you know, if you guys aren't, you should be sitting in cash at at least four and a half to mid fives somewhere. There's a ton of ton of banks that have, have now... Um, uh, open this up. So for those of you who have money sitting in cash, you'd be crazy not to have it be earning, let's say, 5% somewhere. Okay? So that's a huge That's a huge thing. Number one, think about what that does to a bank. Think about if you are the bank. All right. Your job is to keep deposits. And before you were under, not even one, right? Okay. So now all of a sudden you have, let's call it a 4% cost back to your customer, right? To not lose them as a customer. So, so that's a problem for the bank. Um, the other thing is, what do you do with that money? Like, how do you make more money? How do you, how do you make more than 5% somewhere? That's the real problem. And it's hard to do that because interest rates are high. 
So interest rates are high. So I was just looking at like, like this deal as an example we just talked about or, uh, you know, we're looking at a number of deals every week. You know, what's killing the deals is the cost of the debt. And, and then, of course, for those of us who raise money, you know, do syndications or, you know, get money from other people in the form of equity, there's a cost of equity. So if, if, I'm, if I'm trying to get, you know, equity from you, and you're sitting at 5% in savings, I can assure you that unless I'm well above that 5%, you're not going to pass a nickel over to me. And you're doing it right now probably in a government T-bill. Uh, so, or, a, you know, let's say a high savings rate at, at, at one of these big national banks. So, and, um, I, so it's, it's a weird time. And, and I don't see it changing anytime soon, I think was the question. I, I think you're going to see these high savings rates for a while. The problem with that is very similar to what we're seeing with these people that, that did these cash out refis are sitting in these low loans. If you're getting a lot of money in a savings account um, and your, your options are, let's say, real estate or development or the stock market, the last thing you really want is to move your money. Like you're, I, I, a lot of people are just totally comfortable at 5%. And I can see why. So, you know, uh, so I think this is here for a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to get to a YouTube question. Property management asking, can you try to get land re... Ken, do you try to get land rezoned for your multifamily projects or do you try to back into land that's already zoned multifamily by the city? That's a good question. So you can do either or. So it's not a, a you know, uh, black and white. It's if, if you are trying to buy something like, let's say, this office building. Let's just use the example that we started with. I would not ever put any money at risk until it was zoned. So same thing, though, if it's just a vacant piece of land with um, some alternative kind of zoning. So typically, a lot of times, we're not really going from office to residential. That's going to be a little harder. Typically, you're going from, call it low-density residential to high-density residential. So generally, in the, with the zoning maps, if you look at them, there's like, let's just say, one house per acre, to four houses per acre, to 10 houses per acre, to, you know, 40 houses per acre or something, you know, like there's different levels of residential zoning. And so the multifamily falls into the highest level there. And what you're trying to do is get high density residential. So that's more typical. Um, but a lot of times these neighbors come out and they're like, no, NIMBY, not in my backyard. We, we don't want, we don't want apartments next to, you know, next to us. So, so there, um, so that's the risk. So you never buy anything with with uh, without zoning, and um, obviously, even with zoning, it doesn't mean that the city is going to let you have that kind of density. So I'll give you a couple examples. So you might have high density zoning on a piece of property. So um, this has happened. This happens to us every deal, and the, so the broker's saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, you can get uh, you know." 40 units per acre on this deal, which means that you have to be at least four stories. Well, the city might have a height requirement and they might not let you. And you might have some setbacks for parking or maybe sewer or storm or just green. You know, they, they, don't, they, they don't want it. You know, they, they want some um, uh, open, open space and there's open space requirements and those kinds of things. So you have all of these things. So uh, let's say it's 10 acres and, and the, the broker might be saying there you could do 400 units on there. We probably are going to end up closer to 250. So, you know, so it's marketed one way based on the zoning. But at the end of the day, after it's gone through all of the approvals, you might not get, you know, maybe in the mid 200s on that same site. So the reason that's important is because if, if you're banking your price on 400 units and then you're only able to do 250, um, you made a mistake. So, you know, so all of those things are factors. And so you want to make sure that whatever it is that you're going to do on that property, you know, before you close. So our next question comes from Alex from YouTube, or I'm sorry, um, from Andy from YouTube. Ken, would you predict the commercial real estate crash affecting real estate markets and the economy, and will it create another 2008? Oh, it's a good question. I don't think it'll create another 2008, number one. I do not. Now, you got to look at the difference. Most of the commercial 
buildings are sitting in the hands of Wall Street or high net worth people, right? So, you know, call it the 1%. Maybe that's probably not a good, accurate description. But, you, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about managed money, right? And it might be yours, actually. <laughs> it might be in a pension or insurance company or a retirement plan or something. You never know. Um, but I can assure you when you're driving down the road and you're looking up and you're seeing these high rises, you, you know, it's not mom and pop. Right. This is this is Wall Street managed money. And whether it's BlackRock or, you know, any of the big companies, that's managed money. That's not their money. That's that's money that it's actually your it's Main Street's money that they've convinced you that they need to manage. Um, so, you know, that's what it is. And, and so it'll it'll show up in that quarterly statement. Um, what will happen is it'll severely affect lending. That's for sure. Probably won't create like a 2008, which I went through, and that was more, you know, you could fog a mirror and buy a house. Like, you know, like they were, that was an individual. That was an individual that couldn't pay, and, um, you, you know, they were walking away from single family. So we, we don't have a single family problem because actually we're severely under on the single family. If you look at the numbers, I think we're at, less than 50% of the listings of, you know, historical averages. So, so we have a supply problem on the single family side and, um, we have a, we're going to have an oversupply on the office buildings. We're going to have a two year to three year oversupply of multifamily. Um, and then, you know, retail industrial, all that stuff, that's kind of a jump ball depending on where it is. Um, but there's all kinds of stuff going on and commercial category gets lumped into a huge category. You think of everything in there, office, retail, multifamily, industrial, you, you know, there's, and there's more, you know, self storage, all that stuff's inside of there. They're all very different. Absolutely. And I want to get to Marcin's question. Um, how do you think that these discounted offices will impact the evaluations for offices that are 100% leased? Or do you think that it won't? Uh, it's a really astute question. Um, it's, it's, it's good. I know I hate to use this word, but it depends. So um, if you have 100% occupied property, then you are certainly in a very good position depending on your debt. Uh, but cap rates have gone up and that does affect value. So you got to look at the capitalization rate. So for those of you who might not know, you got your net operating income and then you got your cap rate and you divide that into it and that is your typically your value. So your net operating income is higher if you have higher occupancy. And if you're at 100%, it's even better. But as cap rates go up, then your value does go down. And I think that uh, clearly, if you've got failing office buildings in your in your little area that you're in, and you and you're sitting at 100 percent, that can be good. It can be bad. It, you know, maybe like I sold an office building. Actually, the the video that you guys saw, we our average our average um, office size was uh, about 2,500 to 3,000. So what we what we're finding is that that actually market is still pretty good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people that want a couple thousand feet are still actually engaged on the office building. It's the big ones. You know, it's the people that have, you know, 50,000, 100,000, 20,000, you know, they're pairing back. So uh, a lot of it just depends. And, and also if, if you're, if you're an office building owner and you have a bunch of buildings around you that are vacant and you're, you know, the last one standing in a good location, you're probably going to be fine. So, you know, there's a bunch of factors. That's why I say it depends. Awesome. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed and make sure to check out this video we're going to post. It's where Ken runs through uh, the full video on his office yeah. building conversion and why he does not think that that will work. Yeah. Uh, thanks for listening, as always.